In this episode, I had a fantastic conversation with Frank, chairman and interim CEO of Hive Blockchain, the world's first publicly traded Bitcoin and Ethereum mining company with a current market cap of a billion dollars. We discussed Frank's fascinating background in gold, his controversial comments on premium prices for a newly minted Bitcoin, and the current state of Bitcoin and Ethereum mining. We also discussed his views on Bitcoin versus Ethereum, why he's wearing an Ethereum t-shirt, Hive's ESG-focused policy, Elon Musk and the Bitcoin Mining Council, and Ethereum's proposed move to proof of stake. It was a fascinating conversation with some really fun moments. I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you do too. Hi, Frank. Uh, Thanks for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. It's great to be with you, Sunny. So, Frank, you're wearing an Ethereum t-shirt. Is that on purpose or are you an Ethereum believer? (laughs) Well, I am a believer and it's good to see. You know, Sunny, when I first started, uh, there weren't many YPORs. and especially uh, I'm a, a gold member of YPO. Uh, I'm 66. So uh, a few years ago, I was speaking at Harvard. I go every year for the Harvard University. And all my peers thought I was crazy uh, in 2018. And then in 2019, uh, it became 25% of the program at the Harvard University program. So which is really you know interesting to see how it's evolved. Uh, I gave a class on the sort of the evolution of taking place. And what I saw as a money manager trying to launch an ETF in Bitcoin four years ago and recognize it was a no-go due to concerns by the regulators, the SEC, of a uh, anti-money laundering laws and that some hacker would get paid in Bitcoin and it would show up in the New York Stock Exchange. I went to Canada, same thing, and I had this knowledge and my son and my godson kept pushing me in this space. And I also have known for gold. I wrote books on gold. I, the ground floor, the creation of the largest gold royalty companies in the world. Uh, and I have a weekly blog that talks about gold and I have a hundred thousand readers in 80 countries. So I was getting this loop feedback about Bitcoin, another alternative, alternative asset class. Uh, and I became fascinated with it. So when I learned about the mining opportunity of creating a mining company, it was a aha moment because when you're a miner, you you create the original Genesis coin every 10 minutes. You know, it's a jump ball in basketball or a drop puck in hockey, I would tell people. And and there's this, this drive right now to get those on a daily basis, 900 coins. It's all that's being produced. Uh, and can you get a piece of that? And that's a virgin coin you get paid with. Put that on your balance sheet. I, I don't have any KYC or AML concerns. Uh, and so knowing about money management and the gold business and gold mining, uh, there was a growth four years ago of ESG and there was a growth of uh, green only. So when we launched Hive, we had this branding strategy that it would be green and clean. We had sort of green and clean coins. Uh, and that's what we started. We started originally with Ethereum, mining Ethereum in Iceland. Uh, which we purchased immediate cash flow. And then we went to um, Sweden, built that out. Uh, and in, during COVID, we've expanded greatly in Canada because it's hydroelectricity, getting that green and clean uh, 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 business model. Well, there's, oh my God, it's just fascinating background and there's so much to unpack over here. Uh, Frank, tell me about your journey uh, to gold first in that case. Uh, I mean, how did you become a you know this you're writing about gold and you're so much involved in gold tell us a little bit more about that well i'm in the great state of texas a country within the greatest country in the world uh texans are unique and i moved down here 30 years ago from canada i'm a dual citizen uh and and what i what you see in the educational strategy of of the canada you learn geology at a very young age you learn about the ice age and what it did to the topography of canada and uh, where we lived in Toronto and you go on field trips. So you become used to understanding geological terms and significance and gold mining industry was so profitable in Canada during the depression. You learn these things that in, in starting in grade seven and eight and it grows to grade 12. So uh, that, that's where you get, it's easy to go into the gold mining business. But Sonny, I was originally going into medical school. Uh, I was studying uh, 12 hour days and, that really helped me going into investment banking and research analyst. 
I wasn't a shy of 12 hour day work works studying, you know, <clears throat> Uh, anatomy and, and uh, chemistry and organic chemistry. I can still go through organics. Uh, when you go to organic chemistry, you have primary, secondary, tertiary uh, alcohols that go down to carboxylic acids, go to ketones. I still remember all that stuff because you have to get jamming in your brain uh, how you create perfumes and, and drugs. And But you must always look for a catalyst in, in when it comes to chemistry. And that's what people have. You know, <clears throat> You meet someone like you, you give off energy. You give off something very positive energy. Uh, and so we have an exothermic reaction. Other people you can meet, and they take away your energy like a vampire. So that's an endothermic reaction. Well, when it comes to gold mining discoveries, it's an exothermic. Things explode. They go up. They go exponential. So I learn about high-risk investing looking for gold in various places around the world and diamonds. So very early in my life, I became involved in the first diamond, major diamond discovery. Uh, and I was uh, involved in funding uh, various exploration projects throughout Canada. And when you hit, it's an amazing catalyst for a change. Uh, the same thing is with technology. If you're an innovator and, and you can create something that solves a problem, a big problem that has scale to it, you create this massive change. So it's easy to adapt over. And in all my presentations for Hive, I always talk about the DNA of volatility. That I try to warn investors that the DNA of the stock market and gold is 1% daily volatility. 70% of the time, one standard deviation, it's a non-event. And over a week, it's nothing but 4%. But when you start going to Bitcoin and Ethereum, we're talking 20% and 24%. Uh, Tesla, same thing. Tesla's disrupting. So his DNA of volatility grows five to six, seven times greater than what the S&P 500 is. And unless you can stomach that volatility, th then you should be not there. You should recognize that. Um, and it's not that the world's coming to an end with that volatility. It's disrupting. It's creating change. And so that's where it all started being uh, studying uh, sciences. And then I really think that Sonny, studying the sciences helped me um, embrace different types of investing. Uh, the entrepreneurs are really a biological model of survivorship. How fast do you adapt? How fast do you absorb? And your DNA, how, what modifies that so, so that you can survive and thrive? Uh, that is what innovators do in an economy. And so I have always loved that business and I found my basic science background helped me become a good investor. That, that's amazing. What's, what, there, again, there's so much of information to unpack over there. I want to deep dive into all of those things that you mentioned. What's your current uh, kind of, um, uh, you, what do you currently say about the gold market and investing in gold? Are you still bullish on gold? I used to tweet about gold a lot a couple of years back, but I've changed my stance a little bit. What's your take, Frank? Gold's much slower. You know, gold is DNA volatility is the same as the overall stock market. But for the past 21 years, it's outperformed the S&P 500 by 250%. So, so gold is not a lost asset class. Uh, it's much bigger. It's much older. Uh, and what people don't realize, and what you would realize uh, growing up in, in Singapore over to India, that whole area and up to China, uh, gold is the great love trade. And 60% of all demand is love. And uh, I have a new book I'm coming out with uh, called The Great Love Trade, Gold. And, and if you love your country, you should always have gold. I always like to try to comment that Indian women wear six times more gold than what's in Fort Knox in the U.S. Uh, it's hard to fathom that, but you, you can see this idea that the boat people in Vietnam, those that got out safely quickly, had gold. Uh, recently, all the Syrian refugees, those that got out safely and first had gold. Uh, you in Turkey and all the women wear gold bands. If something comes up, they can take off that gold band and get medical help with it. So it's recognizing that you wear your beauty and it always has economic survivorship. That's not going to go away. Uh, that's just my thoughts on that. Um, and your country, you love your country. When, when the Japanese invaded Singapore and China, well, that was to get gold. Why? Because no one would sell them oil. No one would take their paper. Hitler was the same way. So Churchill quickly got his gold sent to Canada. And the U.S. didn't want to take British pounds in case they lost. They took the gold and they made them tanks and they made them planes. So if you love your country and you love. So that's my big macro thesis when it comes to gold. 
they recognize that it's emotional. Now we have 40% of demand is fear uh, because it's money and it's kept. I, I don't think that's going to go away. Um, I think because it's lower vol and it's easier for a portfolio manager with GLD to take a position in it and go out. So, uh, but I do think that having two to 5% weighting in Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum is just wise as, a, as an alternative asset class. It has a greater DNA of volatility. But what I've noticed, and I've written about this many times, the G20 countries in 2000 started really becoming their own sort of quasi cartel. And the information of the central bankers and the finance ministers, often central bankers live with longer with power than the president does. Uh, and so they have this, this club and every year they meet in, in the U.S. And uh, it, it's really fascinating to watch that they were consumed with, tr with global trade, tariffs and trade. And, and that ushered China into the WTO. That huge boom of money's printing, ex infrastructure spending uh, was so big for em emerging markets. And, and with that, along came the demand for gold because the love trade is highly correlated to rising GDP per capita. If we go back 30 years ago, China and India represent only 10% of gold demand. Today, they're 55%. Well, back then, they never had in the top 10 GDP per capita. Today, they're one in three. So we do see something that's a structural macro tectonic plate shift change. Uh, and we now see that China wants to come out with a currency, their own digital currency. That they want to pay in renminbi to the Saudis for their oil. Well, they don't trust their currency and they trust the American currency. So the Chinese have been buying gold. So Chinese today is the biggest gold producer in the world and the biggest importer. So they're doing everything to back up all this money printing on a big scale. Whereas now we're seeing Bitcoin and the mining coming to North America. We see this sort of crossover shift, uh, which I think is you know, quite remarkable because rule of law is cleaner and better here. Uh, there's more interest in the Bitcoin miners. Another YPO, Dave Perel, is building a gigawatt of energy capacity in Texas. There's also stranded electricity because of fracking, the innovator's dream in the oil and gas. There was peak oil when oil was 130 until the frackers innovated. And that was a game changer supply and demand. So <clears throat> with that, uh, I see some really positive switches of, of the flow of this moving over here. The other interesting part was uh, Bitcoin was more concentrated than people realized that when the Chinese all of a sudden cracked down on no mining uh, and they were criticized because they were using coal a lot of the time. So you end up seeing this shift, but the, the dis, what they call the hashing difficulty collapsed. It didn't collapse for Ethereum. So that means Ethereum is more decentralized. So there's, I think it's estimated there's 10,000 Bitcoin nodes around the world. There's 30,000 of these scientists when it comes to Ethereum. And, and there's many more miners in Europe, uh, small miners uh, uh, all over the, of the nation. And so you can see that. So to me, it's interesting to see the two, how they pivot and go in this race. Uh, and I do believe that Ethereum is going to be the app of blockchain. Uh, it's, it's so critical for it. And I do see Bitcoin is going to be Andy Warhol like art. Uh, and <clears throat> because it was capped at 21 million coins. And I, and I spoke at the, in Miami and it was very funny when I was speaking on the panel that I believe, in my opinion, that if you hodl a virgin coin, a Bitcoin, in 10 years, it'll be worth more than what Bitcoin's trading at today because it's been untouched. So it's like having an Andy Warhol original print and it goes up much, much more than some photocopy print of Warhol's work. Uh, and the other day, last week, uh, I was offered a 1% premium for my green and clean coins to start mining. They would pay me a 1% premium. They want to sell theirs out of an ETF that owns, Bit owns Bitcoin and they want green and clean. So add that on in 10 years, it's going to be 10%, could be 30% premium. I think you're going to see art in your back of your wall. You're going to have a Bitcoin and you're going to have a Bitcoin embedded in there with one original Bitcoin. And it's going to have the 64 codes. Some artist is going to paint the numbers for you and they're going to create something that is that it goes up and down your art. And because it's an original number, voila, it has more value like that baseball card that are now growing in NFTs. Unwrinkled 50 year old baseball card has great value. 
how was the how was the response of the crowd at bitcoin miami to your opinions about about this so funny. <laughs> first of all it was booing and then there was chanting frank coin frank coin hold over 10 years frank coin and it's so simple like it's, it's it's not irrational that if i have an original uh, silver coin over 100 years has never been touched hands it's worth more more money than something that's been worn away um so I, it wasn't irrational, but it was another way of looking for people to hold. Right. It, it's just, oh my God, there's just so so many fascinating aspects of this conversation that I have. I, have, I feel like my number of questions to ask you has just dramatically, exponentially increased. What do you think of Peter Schiff? And because for me, if you believe in gold, if you understand gold, it's a very natural progression to understand Bitcoin. But then there are some gold bugs who've not made that transition. And there are some uh, bit, uh, gold, you know, gold bugs like you who have very naturally made that transition. What do you think about him? Well, yeah. So maybe this helps, but for my age and the YPRs that are over 50 is I've grasped the difficulty of Bitcoin. Uh, and I did a two minute video explaining Metcalf's law. It, 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 and it's just a simple, lots of case studies that if you limit supply and enough people trust this product, then it grows in price exponentially. Just it's also really, the stock to flow model. The science is, is, is there, the math is there. So I, I love to tell the relate my peer age, uh, the baby boomers, that if you t look at the diamond market in 1947, the Beers creates a cartel, they cut the supply of diamonds, they go out and hire Madison um, at agencies and start pumping it up that, that this intangible called love, this intangible is validated with this something tangible crystal stone. And there's less diamonds than, than there are crystals. And so they come out and they limit the supply and they give it to movie stars that this represents love. Well, all of a sudden, all the after World War II, all the soldiers are back to work and they're all wanting to get married and have families. It's a great demographic study. And, and you see them using diamonds. And the women want diamonds. The men want diamonds. To validate an intangible called love, a commitment with something tangible. And it grows, and that diamond grows from ten dollars to a hundred dollars to thousand to ten thousand dollars a carat. Then you have S one, S two, S three, V one, V two, V three, and then the diamond market becomes over supply gets broken. Well, what happens if people trust Bitcoin? It's only twenty one million coins. What happens that if you have the greatest shift in wealth you and I are living through right now, that baby boomers are going to give over to their families, the millennials, ten trillion dollars. It's $10 trillion. And a lot of those those millennials are used to gaming. And a lot of them are were gamers. And those gamers got paid in digital money of that game. And if they're very, very good, if they were very good, they got everything free because they paid for it from their own money. They're, they, they understand digital money. They've embraced digital money. And, and, they, and they have nothing but with winning endorphins in their brain. Dopamine rush from winning, yes playing the video game. What did I win? Digital money. Bitcoin's easy. It's easy. So I see this, this transition. So they're going to, this shift is going to not end. It's going to move over. And, uh, and by the way, the, 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 uh, Oppenheimers at De Beers did this in 1965 in Japan. Japanese women never got engaged with a diamond ring. Wasn't heard of. And now they all expect a pinky. They want that little uh, pink diamond if they can get it. Uh, and also the, they changed the uh, demand. They became, they wanted the, a silver look. So they all became platinum rings. So you see it in Japan, it's better against the color of the skin for the reflection is what Japanese women believe. Doesn't matter, it ignites diamond demand. So it's just so easy to see what's going on with Bitcoin. There's more and more people trust around the world and now the magic is it's affordable because a PayPal comes out and sells you fractals. Robinhood can sell you a fractal, a fractal of a Bitcoin. So it's affordable for everyone. Uh, so I believe we're in this sort of long cycle, but we're going to battle a short winter like we had a longer one in 2018 when governments become fearful over how fast Bitcoin was growing. They put a lid on it with the futures market in 2017. And you saw all through 2018 winter, Jimmy Dimon, 
uh, just knock Bitcoin all the time, all the time. Facebook, no advertising, no, no, no discussion allowed of talk about Bitcoin or Ethereum until February of 2019. And Jimmy Diamond comes out with his stable coin. That was the bottom in crypto. Interesting. And then two months later, Libra comes out from Facebook and it goes, Bitcoin jumps to 14,000. And then that G20 cartel gets open and they all become panicking and they're knocking down that, that Bitcoin through Libra, knock Libra, attack, 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 attack. And all of a sudden now the new digital coin they want to come up with is change the name. <laughs> the Libra. So, so you must realize there's this inherent competition between states of government and uh, against, and the more socialistic and liberalism that takes place in countries, the more they are anti-crypto. It's fascinating. And, and if you look at lockdowns, you look at anything that's taken place, the more socialistic, it's easier for the elite at the top not to want competition. So I believe that the, now we have a, a smaller cartel, it's called the G7, but that's Europe. When you add Europe and America's GDP, it's much bigger than China. If the population may not be, but when it comes to GDP, it's massive. And you throw in Japan, uh, you throw in Canada and Australia, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a huge global economic footprint. They have now formed this cartel, and Janet Yellen, who used to be head of the Federal Reserve, who seemed to be very bi not unbiased and down the middle, she now is much more liberalism. And so she hooks up with Elizabeth Warren, and, uh, and they're anti-Bitcoin. So all this legislation is coming out. Why? Because China's much further ahead of coming out with their digital currency. All the G7 countries have got study groups going to come up with their currency. They're going to, it's, it's just going to happen. Uh, and, but we're way ahead of them. And so they have to try to re regulate everything out of business so they can turn around and control that outcome because they want to be able to t tax all tips. If, if everything is digital, they have a visual view of everything and they can control that. And I don't believe now they want to tax the miners, et cetera. They, they can get $28 billion. It's just ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. So that, they, that, that, that number being thrown like that is no one's really thought about it except for let's slow down the business or stop it. And you're referring uh, to the is, infrastructure bill, right? Yeah, it's in a battle as we deal with it now. And I think it'll end shortly by, by the fall, but that's what you're, you have to re learn that you're wrestling. When you're disrupting, you're in a disruptive industry uh, and it's global. Uh, what, what they have to realize is not just criminals are using Bitcoin and Ethereum, and it, it's, a, it's, it's something else that's growing dramatically. Uh, and, and the number of scientists, uh, I forgot to tell you one of the reasons what really tickled me getting in the business. I was trying to launch the Bitcoin ETF. And it's very important because it was a consensus in 2017. I was and at the I consensus. <laughs> yes. Well, Abigail Johnson, who's the CEO of uh, uh, what, $3 trillion, $4 trillion fund group, one of the biggest in the world, uh, Fidelity, uh, a massive discount brokerage firm, uh, mega, mega. People don't realize how big national is. And, and she doesn't speak at investment conferences that I attend. But she speaks at a crypto event. Now, that made me scratch my head and say, something big is happening. And in 2017. And yes, do that. something big is happening. And she spoke the year before. And I go, holy shit. Excuse my French here. But, you know, something is big happening. What am I missing? And if I hadn't attended it, I wouldn't have really grasped that, that they were early, early adopters and early movers. But she had a bigger vision of moving her whole back office to of the blockchain. So that got me interested in understanding the blockchain. So I'd like to share the story with you and that journey of discovery. The blockchain was discovered, created before the internet was unleashed. It was in 91. Who moves all the money around the world? It's not banks, it's telecom companies. Banks use telecom technology to move the money, but it's telecom. Who invented blockchain? Telecom. And it was became the triple entry form of accounting. 
and double entry accounting is so important because it allowed the Phoenicians and the Medicis to build a middle class and become something that never a bond market all came from double entry accounting. And that, that middle class could start their little businesses and grow and prosper all came from banking. There's so much anti-banking, but the biggest advocate is the more socialistic a country is, the more they're anti-banking. Because banking is what really facilitates the middle class. If there's no middle class, there's no real banking. It, it's, it's interesting when you look at history on the big picture. So now we come to the digital world and we have uh, this blockchain, which is which is a triple entry accounting. This is very profound uh, and, and, a, and it's, it becomes a game changer, changer. And the genius Satoshi comes along and writes this algorithm, this piece of art that's more precious than a Rodin sculpture. Uh, it, it is it's remarkable what, what he's, how he's, he understands capital markets, he understands money, and he understands blockchain. And you know, he unlocks this sort of this this model of Bitcoin and caps it, paying everyone fifty new coins for when they start to mine, and then every four years having it and having it. So now it's down to six point two five coins every ten minutes. That was sheer genius because more people are adopting it and, and believing it and using it. So uh, I, I I really was, was shocked by that that the clarity of of, of this concept that it really is disruptive. And it has many more avenues. And what surprised me in the gold mining industry is that the big gold producers have not adopted um, uh, the stop, uh, uh, what they call uh, blood diamonds, stop blood gold. If, if you put the gold where you're mined it from what country on the blockchain, uh, then it'd be much better at controlling the movement of gold that you're, you're not accepting any gold from blood. Yeah, I think I saw, and, some, and that's I saw some Netflix documentary, especially about blood gold in south america i think maybe you're referring to i'm not really an expert in gold but i think you're referring to that right and, and the same thing as africa right right you know, Af africa tribalism uh, and wars have been on for a long time and that tribalism uh, is often the richest man in the world uh was from mali uh at one time i mean he, he ignited inflation on his trip to mecca when he went through cairo and he's just throwing out the gold everywhere, and it was so disruptive. Uh, famous story, of, but he was the, the richest person in the world because he had the highest grade gold deposits and, and mining. Uh, and so I, I don't think that that, that, it, that passion, that emotions are going to go away overnight. Um, but I do believe that Bitcoin is, is, a, is an important alternative asset class. And so with that, the launching of Hive uh, I said to myself, look, at, I, I'm not going to get into the crossfires of the regulator. I'm not going to have an AML concern, a KYC concern. If I hold as many coins as possible, I've got electrical bills to pay, then there's no closed end fund. Then they can buy Hive. It'll become a proxy. I wrote to uh, all the gold investors and followers I have. And out of the, it was unbelievable, Sonny, what happened. It was the first public company to be mining. And we seated, I put up $5 million, became the chairman. And it's been the most incredible roller coaster ride. In five days, I made $100 million on paper. Fascinating. That's <laughs> five days. Five days. That's all. I didn't sell, couldn't sell. And then went down to 2 million during the winter. <laughs> yeah. And then it all came back. Uh, but, and it's do you have the stomach with it? I believe my experience in the gold mining exploration business allowed me to stomach it and weather through it. Uh, and so that was the, the real story of how that grew. Um, and we did. And, and we had some issues with, with, with strategic partners at the beginning. And, uh, and we, we had our differences and we got control of the, of the properties. We dropped the cost by 90%. Just looking at math that was sent to me the other day, that we have the highest returns on invested capital. We're the only people mining both Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, and, and so we're very happy about that. Ethereum has outperformed Bitcoin in the past year. So we've been ma made more money. Uh, and uh, we see that another f fund, another group, uh, HUD-8 came out after us and they bought some machines to mine Ethereum to convert to Bitcoin. Um, but we ourselves believe that Ethereum 2.0, which is coming out August, what, today, the 4th, 
Uh, and uh, it, it's not going to stop. Uh, proof of stake is going to take a lot longer than anyone thinks for proof of work. And all I believe is done so far, which I've bet on, as I strategically bet on, it's going to shrink supply. Uh, Ethereum 2.0, putting up your Ethereum to go and earn a profit, uh, it just takes more supply out of the marketplace. That means higher prices. So if I'm holding, that means I'm building a bigger, bigger position on my balance sheet. I mean, we are 25 minutes in this recording and we still haven't spoken about Hive. But before we do that, one last question. You did mention that you started your Bitcoin or crypto journey with trying to launch an ETF. And I can see a cap with ETF written on it. I don't know if it's got something to do with that. You're wearing a Hive cap and there is a dinosaur, if you want to talk about that so, in the background. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go, go. And let me see here. I have jets here. So, so for the for the audience who's on the podcast and cannot is not watching the video on YouTube, the fantastic visuals and Frank right now is changing his caps <laughs> from a hive cap to a, a jets ETF. Go on, tell us about your ETF journey and uh, what's happening with that. And the women all love the bumblebee, the Gucci bee. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So it's um, but coming back on on sort of the, the crypto space, but I. So the issue is that I launched Jets ETF. I did launch that and it had a huge, huge run last year. And it was interesting for me because I did not know where all this buying was coming from. And, and all my assets had fallen dramatically. I, I had to lay off people. I was, I was really distraught the first week of March of last year. And, uh, and all of a sudden my volume started to pick up in Jets. And Jets and, is listed and, where? Jets is the, is, is the biggest and only airline ETF in the world. Oh, it's okay. It's an airline ETF. Okay. I thought we were talking about a Bitcoin or crypto ETF. I'm like, I haven't heard the no, name no. yet. <laughs> so, so Jets is listed now in London. It's in Mexico City. Uh, hopefully I'll get it to Singapore uh, in that process. Uh, but so it's a $4 billion pr a product. It went from 40 million to 4 billion last year. Warren Buffett gets out of it. But the millennials kept buying through Robinhood. So the volume goes from 40,000 shares a day to 400,000. The prices don't take off for about three months, but they keep buying every day, big, big volume. And in, in the capital markets, to really be efficient, you need price discovery, you need minnows. And the minnows then attract the tunas, and then the sharks, and then the whales, uh, and to get that ecosystem built. So I started seeing this in jets and immediately started to try to say, what the heck is going on? Oh, Frank, it used to be able to get from Robinhood. How many new Robinhood shareholders are buying jets every day? And you can see a thousand, five thousand in a day growing, coming through Robinhood. It was shocking me. Uh, and, and so with that, I started seeing the volume picking up in Hive. But my real interest was what's, what's happening at, at that time with jets. And, um, and they said, it, they're learning from YouTube. YouTube. And he said, yeah, don't you know uh, Sam Chu? I said, Sam Chu who? And so I go on to YouTube and I Google in Sam Chu. Sam Chu has 25 million followers. Sorry, no, 2.5 million, 2.5 million. 2.5 million number. followers. 2.5 million, that means he makes 2.5 million a year in advertising. And, and 2.5 million, and then there's all these other guys that are there. I reached out to a guy, DJ Aviation. It's a 19-year-old kid in England with 300,000 followers. And they're all talking about this jet does this, this jet does that. This is the best place to go to a holiday. So the millennials were, are so consumed with an experiencing economy, not materialistic assets. They want this experience. So they love to go to Singapore, to go to Thailand when they make a score. It's just this different world. Well, they knew in America all the best places to go, the best deals, what jets to go on. And and so the knowledge, so then I started check, t typing in and learning about airlines, started seeing that the, these new investors were not going to Main Street brokerage firms, wirehouses, because the research has all been cleansed by compliance. It's pablum. There's nothing material about it. So in that journey, I discovered that uh, one person explained to me, that after every global crisis, the airlines fall 70%. A year later, they rise 80 to 120%. Tech bubble, SARS, uh, after SARS, it was up 120%. Uh, at 2008, uh, 2009, up 180%. So that's why they were all buying. Buffett comes out, says he's selling all of his airlines, uh, and it's going to be much worse than ever. 
And lo and behold, uh, Jets goes from $12 to 28. He's wrong. They're right. And whenever they say these Robin Hood people know what they're doing, our data shows 25,000 bot Jets around $12 to $13 and it more than doubled for them. So they were pretty accurate. And what I learned from there is that they're much more savvy. Uh, it's that sort of world, the metaverse, that, that new world. I wrote about the metaverse on Friday last week. Uh, and Zuckerberg last week in his earnings uh, forecast and his results of $26 billion, talked about the metaverse 20 times. So it's, it is happening and the quicken of time and how if you're not, if you're not learning, it's because it's your choice. You, you don't you can go to Google and you can go to YouTube and you can learn how to put a, a, a tractor together. You can put anything together on YouTube and you can learn anything. You go to con knowledge learning. You can learn differential equations if you want. Um, and so the world has changed so fast and so rapidly. And, and that was sort of how does this all fit in? There's a big macro theme. And how does crypto fit into that? And that's where I'm trying to really grasp the, the, the significance of this sort of digital money, this evolution. And I'm thrilled that Hive is there. Uh, and in that journey, I met Gabe Layden, and he started a company called Machine Zone uh, that hit six billion in revenue uh, doing gaming. And he's processing 500, he has 500 million instructions per second in 32 languages for kids to game around the world. So he told me that my chips in Iceland can process 100 million instructions per second. Uh, and you can use that for a smart city like he did for in New Zealand. So he put up the cameras all over, show them a lamppost, uh, hook up AI. You know, everyone that's not paid their parking ticket, their car is going to flash. Uh, people that are, are that are most 10 wanted list, it'll recognize with facial recognition. Uh, and you create a smart city that women in particular in a smart city feel safer. Like the women in Singapore feel safer, I would think, than most cities in the world. It would be a, probably the safest city in the world for the sheer size. It's unprecedented. I believe so. Not even not even in China uh, with the Communist Party. Is, are you safer than walking the streets of Singapore? And and so he comments on that. So that's the reason why we recently did this big transaction with NVIDIA, where we got the best performing gaming chips, the A40. And uh, we can mine Ethereum at night and do high performance computing during the day. And and you get paid more for high performance computing. But that's where the gaming shift game money is going to be going into gaming in a, in a growth way uh, and artificial intelligence for cancer research for I know I funded a company for artificial for using AI for gold mining for exploration, uh, how it can take the scientific data and all of a sudden give you a better heuristic mathematical probability of a discovery. And it could turn around and tell you that this geology is like these sites in Norway and in Zambia and in uh, um, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, really? Uh, how does someone ever know all that? And that's what AI lets you do. Um, so I, I think it's going to grow. And that means that I mine for Ethereum. I can get my money back in six to nine months. And then I can use these chips long term. I've written them off over three years, but they're good for seven. So it's it's the other segue that a proof of stake does take place in mining Ethereum that I have all this money invested. I have this other huge growth opportunity. And and I believe you're going to see like Starbucks everywhere. You're going to see small data centers all across America because you need to have them within 200 miles of where they're being rendering for animation for movies or or any type of research they're doing or AI. And, and Amazon charges so much for this service that you could come in at 50% off and make a lot of money. Uh, and also you find for smart cities, the cities don't want their data in another city. They don't want it, so they want it close to them. So I see this as another sort of segue for growing. That's, that's fascinating. And I wanted to ask some Ethereum related questions, some of which you've answered. But then let's get on to Hive. What's the background? Uh, what does Hive do? And what, what is the product that it offers to investors? Just I, I know you've mentioned it, but just to again clarify it to the audience. Hive Blockchain is the first public company to be mining Bitcoin and Ethereum. Hive Blockchain's original vision has been focused on being green and clean coins. We use electro, for electricity from uh, geothermal in Iceland and hydro in, in uh, Sweden and in Canada. 
and we will stay focused on that. And we have a complete ESG strategy. We work with communities. We help kids with education. Uh, we're now creating a program where they learn how to do basic work in a, in a data center and for kids in high school so they can have another job. Uh, and if they want to become coders, then they know everything uh, about uh, uh, building a data center to running a data center to coding the software to, that is going to be used on a data center. Uh, so that's part of our overall uh, ESG strategy. So I'm, I'm really thrilled about it. Uh, last year in Canada, in that journey, I was mentioning about jets. Well, I then started to really do a lot of communication on YouTube. Uh, and there, I didn't realize, Sonny, there were so many followers of Hive on YouTube. I didn't know. It was like, what's happening with Jets trying to what, find what's going on? Then I went and discovered this is also uh, on YouTube and started doing these interviews. And we started creating educational information that, that hundreds of thousands of people would follow. Uh, I spoke at a, at a Kitco, which is the largest platform for gold. And uh, they would get a quarter million hits because I would talk about high mining and gold at the same time. So there was a great crossover and many, many gold investors came early into Hive because they were reluctant. They were fearful of opening uh, an account and an exchange and have their money stolen or hacked. So Hive became their proxy. And Hive has a 92% correlation uh, on a daily basis with Bitcoin, Ethereum price action. And, and so with that, we started this building out and uh, first was Iceland, then we expanded uh, that we were 2% of the Ethereum uh, hashing power of the world. Uh, that means you know, quite significant. Uh, and we lived through the drought. Uh, and basically at the very bottom, we had three key employees uh, that built this company. That's fascinating. And so Hive was the first publicly traded crypto miner and it's listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Yes. Um, and it's obvious for, you know, crypto mining companies to now be publicly listed, but you were the first. I'm sure you must have faced a lot of skepticism when you were trying to do that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was it was interesting because how could I am gold guy and what could I? What, it's like you've left and I kept telling people it's inclusive. It's not exclusive. It's an inclusive component. If you're an asset allocator, you should have 10 to 15 percent. Ray Dalio, the largest hedge fund manager in the world, uh, he's advocated a minimum 10 percent uh, and up to 20 percent at times in gold. So uh, having gold as an exposure is just intelligent and rational. And having uh, Bitcoin uh, in that as an alternative asset class, it's just rational. Uh, it's just going to be more volatile. One has to recognize that as the adoption process takes place. So I try to educate uh, my investment company, U.S. Global Investors. Uh, we've won many awards in, in, in the mutual fund ETF space for education. So we just apply that to the crypto space of educating gold investors of really what we think is going on and why we did it. And, and, a, and a big, we, we were the most liquid name of all these Canadian companies that started. Um, and Riot came after uh, the launch of Hive. Uh, Novakratz took his company public in Canada after the success of Hive. Uh, you know, we launched this in September 2015. I put up the first five million, came the chairman, like launching a product in the ETF. And um, immediately another 25 million was there, uh, launched it and went public. And within three months, we had over $200 million come from institutions to build facilities. Did you face any challenges from uh, regulators and the stock exchange because you're the first crypto mining company to be listed? Yeah, and, and that's why I was very strong in advocating and educating that there's no AML issues. We don't have an AML. We're no KYC. Right. Okay. It, it, we're removed from that. And, and uh, we're only green energy. So uh, th this is... Uh, we're the good guys in, in, in this sort of space. If you're looking for good guys, we're the good guys to look for. Um, but it was very uh, disheartening for me uh, because we weren't listed in the U.S. And Elon Musk, uh, and it goes negative on the crypto mining. Predominantly, it is because one of the uh, companies mentioned that, um, uh, that they didn't care they're using coal to mine. It's the cheapest price. And that started the journey of a backlash. Uh, but I would say that Michael Saylor uh, from Michael Strategies, he showed great leadership and stewardship uh, in putting together a mining group. I was part participating with that, participating with calls with uh, uh, with Elon Musk on a Sunday. I remember that uh, for a couple of hours on 
uh, you know, our, what's our narrative? And, we, and the information was really disinformation. The green movement is a religious movement. Uh, people have to recognize that. Uh, and it's good to be green and clean, but really the, 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 the extremists there and, and they end up controlling the narrative. Uh, and so the data is now out that we consume about 11% of electricity. The better part is China's being pushed out and a lot of those miners have come to North America. But they've also gone to Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan is a big polluter and that's coal. That's a sad part. Uh, they've gone to Russia. It's coal and it's a lot of uh, uh, hydro there. Um, but to get accountability, uh, you really, North American, I think, should make the regulars much happier. When pools are here, we put our stuff, with our, our Bitcoin mining with the pool of uh, Foundry. So, so for us, that was important because it's North America counting, transparency. Um, so from that end, I think it's really evolving. I think the mining community has done a great job. And I share with you, Sonny, that when I first got in this, uh, the other CEOs that were trying to do a knockoff, they, they just, there were no competition. Like the, I felt as a, a CEO, a money manager, all of a sudden running, uh, being the chairman of this company, the spokesperson, uh, it was easy. Um, and they were just trying to ride a, f a fad to make some money. And, and that was, I'm not taking a salary uh, through this whole journey and uh, in, in building it and becoming basically the quasi CEO during the, the winter. Um, but I, I would say that, um, what, when you look at what's happening today, today, the, the, the CEO of HUD-8 is a YPO. -er. The, the CEO of, of Marathon is a YPO. -er. Uh, you know, the, the, these are big game changers and the quality of education. Uh, Dave Perel is a YPO -er and he's on the high board. Uh, and we met at an alternative asset class presentation in Chicago. They wanted me to talk about crypto and Hive. And uh, that's how he flew in to meet me. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, a great story and he's become a great friend and, uh, and giving me some good guidance and the building of data centers. But YPO at the beginning did really embrace it. And, and it's a remarkable, it's gone exponential, uh, not more so in the number of adopters from YPO than I would say, even the price action of Bitcoin the past year. Uh, and, and that's very helpful. Like there was what 40 at, uh, at disrupt in, in Miami. Uh, talking, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm talking with another YPO of, of taking Hive to get listed in Dubai. Uh, the Dubai family is a major shareholder of NASDAQ. So our vision is to get the Hive because it trades so liquidly to be trained 24 seven. So get listed in Singapore, go through that process, get listed in Dubai, get listed in the Nordic, uh, which is controlled by NASDAQ. Uh, so therefore this security can trade all around the world. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I've been, I think, trying to get YPO involved in Bitcoin since 2017. I think at that point of time, there were 15, 20 YPO members interested in the Bitcoin group that I created. And now there are 600 plus members on the Telegram group, right? So it's been fantastic. And especially to see YPOs heading companies like the way you have, the, like, like, like the way you are. And I've done podcast episodes with Fred and with Dave. It's just, it, it is fantastic. Absolutely. How is Elon Musk responding to the Bitcoin Mining Council uh, recently? Well, it's really information gathering and sharing. Uh, and you saw also Darren Feinstein. Darren took his bumpy uh, reverse takeover of a SPAC. It's another YPO, uh, with Core Scientific. Um, and uh, Wes Fulford, uh, I got him into YPO uh, when he's a CEO of uh, BitFarms. Uh, he's left that. He's launched an ETF uh, that's uh, in the crypto space. So, uh, yes, there's many more of us in this space. And, and, and we'll raise the level of awareness. Uh, we all have high standards of care. We all have a greater. I really think that the YPO organization is, is a different level of care, standard of care. It, it's really hard to explain, but it's not, it's not strict. It's about a different morality to it, uh, that it includes your family, it includes your spouse, and includes the relationship you as a father have with your sons and daughters and the wife has with her sons and daughters, in addition to you and the wife. There, there's very few organizations in the world that do that knowledge sharing and caring. So knowledge sharing and caring at our level uh, is where we're so often alone. I cannot go to my board of directors and tell them as a public company, I got this frustration, this frustration, et cetera. But I go to my forum group and I'm going to get great advice. Uh, and I always try to tell people this story about forum. 
my one of my first meetings, uh, I meet this guy and I just moved to Texas uh, from Canada and my telephone bill was $400,000 of AT&T. I couldn't believe how big it was. Uh, people phoning in 1-800-US-FUNDS asking about gold. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this guy tells me we're being gouged and he had a telephone banking business and he told me exactly what I had to do. Went back, got my IT department and started the process and that $400,000 bill went to $60,000. So YPO paid for itself for many, 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 many years. Uh, and, and just the idea of us sharing and caring to help each other out, it doesn't matter, as I said, family or business, you know, there or health, it's remarkable. No, I mean, absolutely. I feel blessed to be a part of IPO as well. Frank, Hive operates in, you know, primarily, as you mentioned, cold countries like Canada, Sweden and Iceland. And not in the U.S. like some of your other competitors or other publicly traded miners. How has your experience been so far in these countries? And is that something you plan to continue as a strategy in the future? Or is U.S. a part of your future plans as well? Well, first of all, it's much more complex. as we have to realize because you have different languages, different cultures, different tax regimes. You have to find a way to navigate. When we have our morning meeting, morning call, it's, it's seven different languages. Uh, that are speaking all English, and so therefore things get lost in translation. Sometimes one word offends another because that's how they interpret it, and, yeah, and I have to play like a referee. You know, all right, stand off here. Uh, but it, it, it works out well, but seeking inexpensive, attractive energy is very important for us, uh, whether it's size, and um, we're getting invited into big municipalities, like big numbers, um, but right now, uh, we're busy building out in New Brunswick. We're building a campus there, uh, and we put a press release showing all the pictures. And our run rate now is over $200 million. Uh, and when you have that run rate, we have margins of about 80% gross margins where Bitcoin is today in Ethereum. So that's very, very healthy. Uh, allows us to continue to grow um, in that position. And we're making investments in DeFi. Uh, we think we're close to a great NFT asset um, where they they do film. They have lots of IP. Uh, uh, companies like Netflix buys their their films, uh, but they own the IP. So you create uh, an NFT around an existing revenue business. So we're excited and, and looking at uh, how that's going to grow. And Ani, I'm asked this question: You know, where are you going to be in, in five years, Sonny? I don't know. You know, I've got to remind myself in '95. Uh, who knew by the year 2000 and who would have thought by 2005 that new companies would be taken over? Google will replace yeah, Ask Jeeves uh, and, and AOL and, and Netscape. And uh, I can go on the list. So this race, we don't know. Uh, we just want to make sure that we are we, we are grasping all the issues and, and being profitable in both Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, spaces. We know the Ethereum space requires much more knowledge gathering because all the products that come out of it, which are actually driving higher Ethereum prices. Uh, and they did this in 2017 also with the ICOs. Uh, so for your listeners, every time there's a new stable coin created by a bank, they use Ethereum as a backbone. Every time there's a new NFT big launch, they use Ethereum as a backbone. And all the DeFi's, most of the DeFi's are using Ethereum as their backbone. So the growth in there is basically at times shrinking the supply uh, of Ethereum, which is very bullish for higher Ethereum prices. Absolutely. And I mean, you are on a massive expansion spree, like you mentioned, you're in the news for buying lots of new mining machines. Uh, any specific reasons for this bullishness right now? or are, And are you concerned about end up being over optimistic and the tide could turn? Well, the big thing is, is you know, executor, Mr. Market will execute you. Uh, it's always been the rule. Mr. Market doesn't know your name, doesn't care. Just execute on your vision. Uh, and that's the biggest concern I have to think about it. And so we do see issues, Sonny, with logistics of moving equipment to China, moving it out. Uh, before the Chinese crackdown, it was much more difficult getting things turned around. Last year, we had to upgrade um, uh, something like 13,000 rigs from a, a four memory gigabyte card to an eight gig memory card. Uh, that process, you know, was sitting 5,000 at a time, coming back 5,000, reinstalling them. Um, that, that 
we had so many logistics issues and seeing the prices rising, rising. So it's that is still the ongoing saga. Can you build your data centers fast enough as your equipment now is coming in? So that the, the risk of equipment not coming in uh, has changed. It seems that they are getting their act logistics together. Uh, selling into mainland China stopped. So the Chinese would always sell internally first and then externally. Uh, and now they just have to sell externally. And so they're selling to North America and to Europe. Uh, and, and shipments are much more uh, quickly. Uh, the best company so far in that whole relationship of dealing with, uh, I would say, is NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA is very, very impressive. Uh, we talked to senior management, the senior, the, the key players in that company. Uh, and then we when we're buying equipment, uh, you don't have to send in 50% of your money. It's something that's always worried me that if I'm going to give something to a company in China, like Bitmain, you have to send 50% of your money up front, and then you have to wait and hope they're going to get your equipment. You know, that, that's uh, um, always troublesome. And Bitmain, we're, we're fighting with each other. Now they've gone to two different entities. Uh, and, and so I've had calls directly with the CEO of Canon. Uh, twice now, making sure we're getting our equipment. They've done a great job. Michael BT is, is also, if they say they're going to deliver, they deliver. Um, but we had a lot of issues uh, with the other entities. So I think these are some logistics issues that you have to be concerned about. Are you building enough good energy uh, facilities? And are you getting equipment to go into it? That, that synchronization is more challenging because of logistics. So... Uh- Absolutely, uh, Frank. I recently did a podcast with fellow YPR Fred of Marathon, and he mentioned that they have the lowest Bitcoin production cost of $4,000 right now for mining Bitcoin. What's your Bitcoin production cost? And according to you, how do you compare with other large uh, Bitcoin miners? I would think that my electricity is cheaper than his. So I would bet it's, it's pretty close. But it all depends what machines you're using. Um, we had a bunch of old S9s we got on an acquisition last year during COVID free, like 10,000 machines, uh, just get this facility away from us. And, uh, and so, uh, it's interesting because now we're selling those machines, uh, they seem to be going to Latin America, uh, for $210 a machine. Uh, they're much more costly to mine with, uh, there's no doubt, but we're just continuously taking them off the shelf as more micro BTs and, and Canon Avalons come in. Uh, switch out, switch out, then we'll sell the S9s. So I would say that uh, our costs overall are dropping. But if you looked at our, if you have nothing but S19s, you will have a lower cost because the machine's more efficient. But a micro PT is is, is very, very strong uh, and very close to it, but not as close. As you know, you can go on the web and you can see the profitability each day. And we do that every day. We look at the profitability of all our machines in our morning call. And we want to know that's making $2 a day. That's making $7, that's making $9, that's making $32. Uh, should we reposition machines? Uh, what happens? So one of the, we found that we weren't getting machines back fast enough from China, GPU chips uh, from the AMD, that AMD model and uh, upgrade it. So we said, okay, we're going to mine, big, we're going to mine Ethereum Classic. Very profitable. Mine that, pay the electrical bill, hold more. Gives you a chance to have more cash. Uh, so th- we've done things of that, like that nature. And what are Hive's future plans? Uh, any Sunny Bitcoin special announcement? I think we're going to be at an Exa hash this week. I'm hoping that this week. Um, and that will be a big celebration of popping the champagne uh, to get to you know, that first Bitcoin Exa hash. When you combine our Bitcoin and mining, we're at 1.7 now. And people don't realize if you, it, 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 we have to do this conversion uh, of how much Bitcoins can you get. So uh, we're so far, we've been the most profitable crypto mining company. That's fantastic. And, and you mentioned on your website uh, that because of low working capital requirements, you do not immediately need to sell the crypto that you want from mining. Do you keep both Bitcoin and Ethereum on, uh, on your balance sheet or do you sell one more than the other? In general, what's your view on Bitcoin and Ethereum as a part of your reserve? So it's a great question. Um, We survived, this company survived because I started applying from the gold business, our our quant trading model. So I like to, and I write about it. I've written about it on my website. Um, It's called Managing Expectations, that every asset class has its own DNA of volatility, and you can measure it. The magic is to measure it over a daily versus 10 trading days versus 20 trading days. 20 trading days is a month 
versus 60 trading days in crypto is, is um, uh, or 90 trading days is a, is a calendar quarter and then one year. So whenever they all go up in a sequence up to more than two standard deviations in a day for, for different time periods, then you've got to sell 10% of your position because uh, mathematically odds are you're going to get a correction. So that's how we survived through it. Uh, and we've done that in selling, like we sold some Ethereum at 4,000. You know, that uh, it was just, they all hit, boom, they have the discipline, uh, which, you know, looking back, you'd always just sell all of it, but no, we just, you know, sell it, take the $4 million, buy more equipment. Right. So you, you're saying rather than deciding between one of the two assets, you kind of use your, your, you know, what the price movements are in each asset to kind of decide which one to keep or which one to sell. Yes. But we've been public about hodling. So we've, we've hodled most of the, uh, this year so far. Last year, we were hodling about um, uh, 60%. Then we went to 100%. And then things got a little crazy on the upside. So we would just mathematically shave 1%. So 1,000 coins out of inventory of 27,000 is de minimis. And, 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 but it just shows we're using our discipline. Then we mine it. As it's corrected, we mine it all back. That's interesting. And what's your current take on uh, the Bitcoin price and the state of the market right now? Well, I, I think, you know, our liquidity is about $100 million approximately right now, coins and cash. Um, it was over when, when Ethereum was 4000 and, and it was over when Bitcoin was uh, uh, back over 50000 But it'll come back because we continuously add to our Bitcoin position. Uh but I, you know, I, I think uh, we're very conscientious of that. Uh, we also used to start using AMT the, uh, at market. Um, so on big days when the stock is up large, we can sell one percent of the position of the daily trading volume. Net money comes into the treasury, um, so it never dampens the price. It's never a big bot deal that that overhangs the stock for a while. Um, and so that's a great mechanism uh, that the Royal Gold Royalty companies have been using. And you're wearing an Ethereum T-shirt. I just want to ask you one question. When you compare Ethereum and Bitcoin, don't you think that Ethereum, uh, Ethereum's price has been correlated to Bitcoin's price and you end up taking a lot more risk for more or less the same return? At least that's been historically the case. What's your view? Well, the difference is the Bitcoin community is much more focused on mining uh, and, and holding uh, and Bitcoin advocates. Uh, they're not mining, but they just believe in it. The Ethereum is a very different ecosystem. It's three times bigger um, that you see around the world. A number of scientists that are coding and creating products and apps with it. So, it, and a lot of them sort of have a sort of utopian philosophy towards uh, Ethereum. And there's a big push to this proof of stake or, over proof of work. Uh, I don't think proof of work is going to disappear. Uh, proof of stake uh, is, is slowly growing. Um, and it doesn't really threaten me um, for another couple of years. Uh, but most people have asked me, since Hive went public, the biggest pushback I had, proof of stake is coming tomorrow and you're going to be out of business. Touch wood. We didn't listen to them and we went long in mining Ethereum. Because when you have a bull market in gold and silver, silver outperforms gold. And when you have a bear market, silver uh, falls more than gold. In a bull market for crypto, Ethereum outperforms Bitcoin. In the last bear cycle, Ethereum underperformed Bitcoin. So we are still in a bull market because Ethereum is outperforming Bitcoin. Do you, That's my opinion. Do you believe that when this fundamental change happens, maybe it happens later rather than sooner, that it, pro it Ethereum faces a existential risk at that point of time because this fundamental transformation to almost another coin has not yet proven itself technically and in the market space. Do you think at that point it's at risk? Yeah, well, you know, I I, I, I can't forecast. Um, you know, I've got to be able to forecast something that, that I can really see mathematically. I could forecast this time last year that the DAG file for mining Ethereum was going to become so big, like a piece of lasagna, that a four gigabyte memory card couldn't process. So it would all of a sudden, those GPU chips would become worthless mining Ethereum. Mathematically, you could see that by February to April this year. And that's what happened by April. 
So those cards that didn't get upgraded, that had four, we just start mining Ethereum Classic. It's very profitable, pays our electrical bills. So we win-win. And, and so that is much more predictable of when proof of stake takes over proof of mining. But I don't think this proof of work is, is just going to evaporate. I just, uh, and so we'll just see. A uh, mess part is I have chips that give me optionality to pivot with. I have all this money sunk in these chips. They're not going to become worthless. I have the best chips, gaming chips in the world that every gamer wants. They're worth more than gold. They come, they come like this size in a gold foil and, and they're worth $6,000, $7,000 for gamers. And I got them below that price and for, for, for this uh, high performance computing. So I'll get my mine Ethereum at the beginning, get all my money back and then build out the high performance computing. If something happens there uh, with um, uh, proof of stake, it doesn't matter for me. And you know, when you're proof of, when you're doing high performance computing, you go from making $2 a day off a, off a AMD chip to $2 an hour. So I feel, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I don't, it doesn't make me not sleep at night. And the last question, what is the current uh, market cap of Hive and what are your predictions for the stock price in the foreseeable future? Well, right now it's uh, over a billion dollars. Um, we'll get out the next week our, our financials, which I believe will be, make the market very pleasant uh, because we made money every quarter last year. If you, Blonity is a guy that out of Germany is a Mercedes energy analyst that follows his industry and he takes everyone's public data of hashing power and creates a financial model. So almost every day he knows how much money you should have made. So really, you know, that's the nice thing about crypto. It's pretty transparent. <laughs> and uh, so his data, he asked me, because we haven't published it yet, he said, it looks like you made more in February than you did the previous quarter. And I said, if your models are saying that, I agree with your models. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. So I, I think we'll have a great quarter. We'll have a phenomenal year. I'm, I'm thrilled about uh, how that's evolving. And we just got to get those financials filed right away. And that'll be the exciting part. Uh, and then get on with the listing in Asia. Super exciting times to be in crypto. Uh, for us, for I'm absolutely sure for you. Before we wrap up, uh, Frank, how can people find you, find Hive, and find all the other amazing resources that you've mentioned? Just for the audience, I'm going to take all those uh, links uh, from Frank and then put it in the show notes. Uh, but um, maybe you can just mention a couple of important websites or Twitter account or whatever people can follow you and follow Hive. Uh, usfunds.com. It's really simple. Usfunds.com. Uh, open it up and look for Frank Talk. Sign up and you'll start getting my articles and research, and uh, uh, which comes out on a weekly basis. My investment team and marketing help me to put it all together. Uh, and especially last week, you'll love the story on the metaverse uh, of where we are and how, why and what, the, what it means in the history of it. Uh, and you can also go, which I recommend is High Blockchain Technology. Uh, their YouTube has lots of rich educational content. And what about the books that you mentioned, uh, Frank, that you've written or published or going going to publish? Where's that going to come out? Well, I've got so many, you know, I've, I've written a book called The Gold Watcher. Uh, I've got a new book called The Great Love Trade Gold. Um, and and so I, I think uh, that's not out yet, the, the new one. But... I, I think if you follow, just go to the U.S. Fund site. Um, and also, I would really recommend you look up managing expectations. It explains how you use basic quant models to manage volatility in your favor so you don't become frightened by it. That sounds really interesting. I definitely want to check it out. Frank, it's always a pleasure to talk to a fellow Vipuer who is so involved and, you know, out there in the crypto, in the Bitcoin space. If you like this video podcast, please like and subscribe. Frank, thank you so much for doing this and thank you for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. This was a fascinating conversation. Well, th thank you, Sunny. And I hope everything opens up by the fall that we can get over there and I'll come visit you in Singapore. I love your city. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, it's fantastic. I've just realized over the last one and a half years that it's really small and I'm waiting for the borders to open up and hopefully would be, in spite of being in this space for a really long time, my first visit to an actual Bitcoin mining site. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the trip for you, because we live near the equator, is to go to Iceland with us. That would be absolutely Because there's so much to do. You you get on a motorcycle and you go up a glacier. Oh, it's just... uh, 
good fun things which like seems like dreams are made of right now but absolutely we are going to i'm going to take up that invitation that uh, offer uh, frank yeah. thank you so much thank you cheers